Today's podcast is brought to you by Fish Window Cleaning, the largest professional window cleaning company in the country. With over 200 locally owned and operated franchises, you are sure to be able to find an office near you where they can help you brighten your world at work or at home. For professional window cleaning at residential or commercial properties, look up Fish Window Cleaning at fishwindowcleaning.com. I'm Josh. And I am Alyssa. And we are back with today's episode of The Podcast Was On Fire. And it wasn't my fault. A read-along pod where we dig into the good, the great, and the problematic of the Dresden Vile series by Jim Butcher. I'm an old jaded Dresden vet. And this is my first time through. And we're holding hands through this thing, and right now we are finishing up the last few chapters of Summer Night. Which was spectacular, by the way. Book four. Really solid entry. Mm-hmm. Four real days. Came out in 2002 by Jim Butcher. Man, really impressive book. And it, it, I didn't, re- you know, I mentioned on here, I didn't love it at the beginning, but it really picked up, and that was great. But we'll get into all that way, 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 way more important than that. Mm-hmm. How are you doing today, Liz? I'm wonderful. I am doing quite good. It's been a, uh, a productive weekend at work. Got to hang out with my boyfriend all day yesterday. Oh, woo! All my oh, plants are still alive. Breaking hearts all over the world. <laughs> you can't, you're like a stripper. You can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, our, our our listenership just <laughs> plummeted. <laughs> oh goodness gracious! Uh, but yeah, I got my plants are still alive. I'm uh, having a very productive kind of weekend. Knock on wood. Awesome. <laughs> very, very cool. I did not have a very busy weekend, which is my favorite kind of weekend. That's pretty. But good. Uh, I got the national championship qualifier coming up this week so i'm gonna be very engaged and busy and hopefully we do good things and peak at the right time fingers Um, crossed yeah absolutely we'll see capable of really doing anything in either direction but (laughs) (laughs) um it's a great group so we have the last potentially the series finale of ted lasso tomorrow night a few days before you guys listen to this podcast uh what else happened Bad news out of Turkey, unless you're a big er- Erdogan fan. So sorry to our new Turkey family. Oh, and my favorite player left Liverpool. He played his last Liverpool game. Bobby Firmino. I don't know who that is, but oh, I'm sorry, Josh. Roberto <laughs> Firmino. They call him Bobby in Liverpool. It's great. Ah, um, that's about right. <laughs> it's very Liverpudlian of them. Oh, uh, scored a goal. They drew because they were away, and they're absolutely atrocious this year. But uh, what can you do, you know? Um, Ups and downs, babe. Ups and downs. You you get through it. Life is good. We don't have any actual Liverpool downloads, I don't think. So I'm going to piss off our one Mancunian downloader. And uh, all the London people probably don't care. (laughs) (laughs) They've got their own battles to fight with each other. Um, (laughs) But yeah, short of that, I, I went on a bike ride today. That was great, too. It was terrible. Beautiful. Terrible. I went up the... (laughs) <laughs> crappy hill my nemesis hill it took me about an hour and a half to go 600 feet um it didn't but it took me a long time and it felt worse than that and people were blasting by me on their e-bikes oh bastards yeah, assholes <laughs> uh, but beyond that anything else before we get going here no nah, i'm ready to let's jump on in let's rock we have just solved a couple of mysteries here we figured out who the ghoul was Chasing him all around town was um, hired by. That was the Red Court. And Fix. Ace. Excuse me, Ace. Ace, one of the four changelings from the picture earlier that was 
supposedly a friend. Turned out to be a foe. (laughs) We got a lot of that going around today. Um, And he ended up shooting Meryl with the rifle. She's okay-ish. She's going to keep continuing. They found the steps, the magical starlit steps, up to Chicago, above Chicago, I think is what... uh, Chicago Leah called it. Chicago, yeah, she keeps calling it that. And he, he keeps calling it that. Yeah, they you know, there's a war breaking out. We figured out basically all the mysteries have been solved at this point. We know it was the summer lady, Aurora, and the winter night, Lloyd oh, Slate, among <laughs> others, conspiring with Elaine among them, conspiring yeah, to do all this dance where they gave Lily. The winter, uh, n- the summer night's mantle. They froze her in a statue, and they're gonna try to free her and give her power to, over to winter. So they will have an extra night, and all the things will be out of whack, and we're gonna have some ice ages and some terribleness. But at least people won't be fighting, right, Aurora? <laughs> the bozo. So uh, I think that about does it to catch us up here. We got a bunch of. Uh, child werewolves they're not children they're young adult werewolves we got two changelings and we have our everyone's favorite wizard mr dresden and they're hopping up some steps take it away ice all right harry starts this by talking about jet travel how jet travel is pretty freaking remarkable but on any flight in the country Get, but get on any flight in the country, and I absolutely promise you that you will find someone who, in the face of all that incredible achievement, will be willing to complain about the drinks. And Harry is that guy. <laughs> did, you feel like, did you feel like that landed? I thought it was fantastic. Because okay. it was very much like, oh no, I'm totally that guy right now. And because he, he couldn't have made an escalator? Initially, on my first read-through, I didn't really think much of it because I wasn't I was breezing through it. But I like digging into it. I didn't really love it. It felt like kind of like a bad stand-up routine. But now that I'm sitting here looking at it as I'm you know, going through it with you, mm-hmm. um, I think it, this is a Louis C.K. did this 20 years or 15 years later before, before he was uh, Me too and I stopped supporting Louis C.K. <laughs> but uh, a very similar bit. So this is a Seinfeld effect where it feels like it's boring and rote because I've heard it done 15 years later. So I apologize, which is a, a uh, trendsetter. Trendsetter, I guess. Maybe well, good, ho- hopefully good people follow his lead as well as the other kind. Well, and the thing I saw with this was it's the comparison to the greatest, the greatest scientific marvel of the last 200 years is flight. That's reasonable, right? Oh, yeah. And I, I love the way he describes it, like a loophole through air pressure. Yes, I thought that was fantastic. But and what he and they people complain about drinks. He is walking up a magical staircase into the heavens. And he is complaining about it being a staircase versus an escalator. That was the comparison I drew from it. And oh, yeah, I no, I mean, that's, like, that's the comparison he makes. Yeah, no, I. I I'm sitting here and it's like one of those things where like my first kind of thought, I don't like it. And then I go back around and I actually really do. Mm-hmm. Um, also, also, there was like a whole to do in the mid 2010s or late aughts about Dane Cook stealing Louis C.K.'s bits. Mm-hmm. And this is like, I mean, I, I don't want to say he stole it by any means, but like, I feel like this is almost word for word a bit that he did, although his was about like be quiet, use your imagination or something, but the same thing, like, after all this, you're just bored. I feel less bad about it now because I know why I thought it was rote, because I've heard it before. Um, I put my brain dusted itself off for a second there. But it, it still feels kind of out of character, out of the scene. But again, we know that he's writing this retroactively so he's not telling the story as it happens even though that's how it sounds um so he he could have these like fun little asides and it would make sense right in the moment it wouldn't really in my mind like you're going up to like this i don't know 
Well, no, he, he, wouldn't, he probably wouldn't be thinking that in the moment. You're right. I agree with you on that. Um, but I, I didn't think it, I honestly, I mean, I guess I don't listen to enough stand up. I, I didn't think it was very, I didn't think it was uh, cliche or wrote in any way, shape or form. Okay. But, I, I mean, mean, sometimes, sometimes I'm harder on it than I maybe needs be. Certainly that's been true so far. <laughs> But I, I really enjoyed it. I loved how he talked. Basically, he's describing jet travel as magic. and which, which I love because he talks about when he and Elaine were studying, you know, the binding spell last time, how they were studying magical formulae and just and like there is so, magic is like quasi it even uses the word frame uh, term quasi physics, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, it is quasi science science. You know, the way they describe magic in this universe is much more scientific and less fantastic than, you know, other wizardry that I've read or experienced certainly before, you know, like figuring out formulas to do how spells work Mm -hmm. is a new and interesting, you know, we've we've seen that all the way back since back in Stormfront. Um, And I think that's really cool, but, and it makes sense then that, you, you know, it's the, uh, what's the adage I have no idea. Sufficiently advanced science will look exact. Will look will be indiscernible from magic or whatever. Um, uh, and that's kind of you're right. He's describing it as basically magic. It's magic. We throw you in a in a box and we huck you over the an ocean. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, even if we kind of ex- understand sort of why it works, but we'll get there with some of the magic. I guess it's just yeah. That's kind of cool. I and and I really just I. I appreciate how throughout this, all of the science or all of the magic is grounded in some sort of logic within the universe. Yeah. That's like super cool and unique to this. Yeah. And it's, it's very, and I think that sort of is kind of almost where we're going here, where the science of the real world is almost grounded in magic. Yeah, no, I I really like, I like that thought. You you definitely, uh, something I didn't see for sure is that kind of connection, but I, yeah, um, he, he does bring that up sometimes, you know, the religion of science and stuff. And like mm-hmm. that, that kind of connection does kind of, there's a through line there that does actually make sense there. Like I dig it. Yeah. I definitely like you've, you've walked me into getting it more than I started. So awesome. Cause I, I mean, I really did. I really thought it was, it was, it was a little cheeky where he's just like, people are complaining about the drinks. And yeah, that was me. I was totally that one. He says, yes, I was using a legendary and enchanted means of travel to transcend the border between one dimension and the next, and on my way to an epic struggle between ancient and elemental forces. But all I could think to say between panting breaths was, yeah, sure, they couldn't have possibly made this an escalator. I mean, it was just so perfect. I really liked how perfectly matched those two things were. We're hurtling through the sky in a tin can, but in a loophole in physics. And you're complaining about the drinks? And he's, you know... I do the, worry sm- sm- the smart people that listen to our pod will actually have something to say about it not being an actual loophole. I'm sure, oh, it makes sense to them, but I know to it's me, it's all magic. Loophole. I don't but even it, know how it's... microphones work. <laughs> but it is very... I really enjoyed that aspect of it. So they climb up the stairs and come out in the land in which Leia had shown him. And they're standing on storm clouds over Chicago. But it didn't look like it had before the opening curtain. What had once been rolling and silent terrain sculpted of cloud, smooth and naked as a dressing dummy, had now been filled with sound, color, and violence. The storm below that battlefield was a pale reflection of the one raging upon it. This is war. This is like one of those scenes in the movies where... There, the the camera or the character is walking through the battlefields, where they're walking through things exploding, and and I recently started watching Perry Mason on HBO, and he was in the war, and there are all of these. There's frequent flashbacks to where he's walking through the battlefield, and this totally made me think of it because there are. Things exploding all over, and here the, the sounds rang through the air, the crackling snap of lightning and the roar of thunder following. Trumpets high and sweet, deep and brassy, drums beat to a dozen different cadences that both clashed and rumbled in time with one another. And it's this whole 
orchestra of sound. He describes it as taken as a whole. It was its own wild storm of music, huge teeth rattling, teeth rattling, overwhelming and charged with adrenaline. Wagner wished he could have had it so good. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, but that makes sense. You can hear this. You can hear this, this cacophony of sound. Ooh, a good word. And it's just, it's war. But it's also got this melodic music playing. It's fascinating. Well, you, I, I think especially because it's the she, mm-hmm. it's definitely going to be a lot less, more graceful. Yes. Right? It's still, I mean, you know, war is hell and it's still going to be war. But I think, like you're saying, the melody and like kind of like the flow of it, I think, would be much more beautiful than were it just like a mundane war, you know? Well, but then he starts talking about these trolls or whatever they are, where they're these, they're these, well, they have their bulbous noses the size of light bulbs behind helmets. Look, they, they, they were made out of something like bone. And it's very, uh, you've got the graceful she, but you also have these clunky, clunky dudes. Like, you've got your trolls, you've got your, um... I don't know. I, I, well, trolls somebody's got to play the bass. And... That's why we bring the trolls. <laughs> there we go. Uh, and yeah, I can't. I can't play anything. The um, the troll looks at them for uh, for a minute, and it's kind of processing, and then turns away as though it's just interested. It's just kind of an interesting moment where it's all of this cacophony. This troll looks at them. Big, huge, gigantic troll with a bulbous nose looks at them, becomes disinterested, and walks away. And they just a description of all the different types of she, all the involved parties. You have the sylph, you have the fairies mounted on long-legged war horses. And he says, I couldn't see the whole of the valley below. Some kind of mist or haze lay over it and only gave me the occasional glimpse of a whirling masses of troops and beings, ranks of somewhat human things, messed together with one another, while other beings, some of which could be only called monsters, rose up above the rest, slamming together in titanic conflicts that crushed those around them as mere circumstantial casualties. And I like the use of the word titanic here, because titanic has two meanings. It's not capital (laughs) T like titans, but it is also, it's on a huge scale, but it's also these massive titan-type creatures clashing i really and like also, and also <laughs> our summer queen titania yes yes exactly triple entendre it's just it's fantastic i really i really liked that the use of that particular word don't know if it was intentional still loved it you have to imagine uh, but he says point, he can't almost every single thing he does in here is intentional because it's <laughs> In a very, in a, a very good scene. way, yeah. Yes, very much so. Um, so Harry can't see the stone table from where he is. He couldn't even figure out which way to go. The stone the gatekeeper had given him was leaning in one direction, but that was going to lead him right through a battle. What's next? Meryl asked. And they're yelling at each other because they can't hear each other. And... So Meryl asks, what next? And she has to yell because of the, the din of the battle, which makes sense. It, but it gives you that, that feel of how loud things are. And Fix is right next to him and saying something. And he's, it's so loud, he can't even hear him. I, and like, then that. She, I like that, yeah. Oh, that. yeah. And, but it's kind of like Meryl has this big, booming voice. And Fix, he always is, you know, he has this kind of meek voice. He's right next to Harry and he can't tell what he's saying. And then this she knights, mounted she knights, leaves the others and comes riding towards us. He raises his visor and the sounds of the battle cut off. Like someone had turned off a radio and silence threatened to put me off balance. And this uh, night. This reminded me of the, uh, the interaction with the gatekeeper mm-hmm. all the way back at the beginning. Yeah, it's very different, but just this similarity of like shutting everything else out. Like we need to have this conversation right now. You need uh, to not be distracted. Yeah, just an interesting symmetry there. I um, but it, 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 I can't remember. There's a film where this happens. It might be like The Matrix or something like that, where they're in a busy, loud place and everything goes silent. Nothing around them stops, but everything goes silent. Um, 
and in the archaic language back and forth with the Shinite, he says he needs to speak with post with Queen Mab post haste. And he says the the MS that sorry, the She Knight says, I will guide thee, follow, and bid thy companions put away their weapons ere we approach her majesty. I nodded and said to those with me, put the teeth and cutlery away, folks. We need to play nice a little while longer. <laughs> I love that. So and good. then they continue on. And Mab sits atop a, a white horse and the werewolves and Fix are stunned. Oh my God, Fix whispered. I glanced back. The werewolves were simply staring at Mab, much as Fix was. Meryl regarded her from behind a forced mask of neutrality, but her eyes were alight with something wild and eager. Steady, folks, I said, and stepped forward. And he tells the fairy queen that our thief is the summer lady Aurora. Mab shows a bit of surprise. Her eyes widened. But he figures that she, she kind of got the gist of it all. And so she asks... Mm-hmm. Real quick, I just want to talk about that. Uh, Ma- the look on Meryl's face. Remember out fr- um, back at the docks when she and Ace were talking, she said they they feel themselves being drawn because the the Winter Court is going to war. All the changelings, all the people of her court, she's drawing them. So Meryl right here is, has a different experience than the werewolves are kind of in awe. Meryl is trying to like, She's also obviously in awe because yeah. you, know, you meet a famous fairy monster queen. She's power and gore- power and beauty. But also, she has she's being pulled by Mab right now, right? She's like, I, we don't know what that entails, but they both said they feel the draw yeah. of the Winter Court. So it, she's got a, a, a very different s- situation here than anyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, Again, I don't really have a point there besides just acknowledging that. And like, I really like Meryl throughout this whole scene because like she's she's experiencing way different things than everyone else. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, in the end, does the right thing for her friends and like is just willing to give it all up. But it's just really cool. Like these little moments you see where like she's already like this is a crazy difficult time for her. It is. It's it's she's. In awe, but she is something wild and eager. So she's kind of got, there, there are, she does have dimensions. And that's, through the last couple chapters, we've really learned a lot about Meryl's dimensions. And it's, I really like it. It's really yeah, cool. Yeah, I wish we had gotten more of her. Yeah. Whether in a, a further book or, you know, maybe in a, in a, I was the one complaining about how convoluted the beginning was. And I was just, and I know I want her to be introduced earlier, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, now there really probably wasn't a way to do it. It's like, hey, Jim Butcher, if you're listening, <laughs> can we get a little story about the changelings? Just saying. Uh, back maybe hanging out with uh, Ronald Rule <laughs> at Disneyland. That'd be a great short story. <laughs> just saying. I'm just saying. Um, anyway, so Mab recognizes the tools that the gatekeeper gave Harry. And she's it's Rashid. What is his interest in this matter? And Harry, in the most eloquent way one could possibly imagine, says, uh, certainly he isn't, a uh, you know, it isn't like he's representing the council and they're interfering. <laughs> she, Mab took her eyes from the battle long enough to give me a look that said quite clearly that I was an idiot. I know that. And your ointment, it's his recipe. I recognize the smell. He helped me find this place, yes. So what does the old desert fox have in mind this time? No matter, the stone cannot lead you to the table. The direct route would place you in the path of battle enough to destroy any mortal. You must go another way. And Mab wants to help. Her power is waning, so she's trying to help Harry get to the table. The field is lit in gold and blue, green mist swirling with violence where they met. The gold and yellows are obviously summer. The blue is obviously winter. And I like that it's a green mist because it's the clash of the two colors. I think that's just basic color theory, but still, it really sounds really cool. <laughs> and she says, our, our knight has not taken the field with us. He has been seduced, I presume. Yes, I said, he's with Aurora. That's the last time I let Maeve hire the help. 
I indulge her too much. She lifted her hand, evidently a signal, and scores of bats the size of hang gliders swarmed up from somewhere, launching themselves into a web-winged cloud into the skies above. We yet hold the river, wizard, though we lose ground on both sides now. Thy godmother and my daughter have concentrated upon it, but reach the river and it will take thee through the battle to the stone table. And she tells him to hurry. This is like the third time in this book a fairy has told somebody to hurry. So obviously this is pretty dire. If the queen of the winter fairies is telling him, get your ass up there, you know, hustle. Yeah, exactly. That's a, this is a big fucking deal. And we get more of the description of the battle. We pass through hundreds more troops, most of them units evidently recovering from the first shock of battle. Scarlet and blue-skinned ogres in fairy mail towered over me, their blood almost dull compared to their skin and armor. Another unit of brown-skinned gnomes tended to their wounded with bandages of some type of moss. A group of sylphs crouched over a mound of bloody, stinking carrion, squabbling like, like vultures, blood all over their faces, breasts, and dragonfly wings. Another troop of battered, lantern-jarred, burly humanoids with wide, bat-like ears. Goblins. Dragged their dead and some of their wounded over to the sylphs, tossing them onto the carrion pile with business-like efficiency, despite their fellows' feeble screeches and yowls. This is just the, the reality of war, is what we're seeing it from the she, from the fae. And he accurately describes it as nightmarish carnage. There's really no other way to describe that. But this is probably, even though this is all the fantasy characters, the one thing I kept thinking was the smell. It probably adds to the nightmare. And I can only imagine, he mentioned something about the werewolves, how they're, they're probably dealing with it worse because of their enhanced sense of smell. And that, that ointment under their eyes won't help the smell. It's just for their vision. And so we hear more about the murky shades of green mists and they head towards the water. He says, we run forward and get to the river. Don't stop to slug it out with anyone. Don't stop until you're standing in the water. Or, I thought, until some fairy soldier rips your legs off. And I ran forward into the proverbial fray. So Lissy's chapter was more approaching the war from the outside. And certainly there were, you know, there was some interaction with it, but they were trying to, you know, they met up with Mab and they got their direction here. But now we're in the thick of it and we're trying not to fight anything. We're trying to get as, you know, as quickly as we can through by, you know, over the river and through the woods to grandmother's stone table. <laughs> and just every single part of this chapter is a new ridiculous battle. Mm -hmm. um, the there's goblins fighting she, I believe, because there's somebody shooting arrows at them. But way cooler than any of that is there's these gigantic bumblebees, oh, the yeah. size of park benches, um, flying around, which is just such a cool and terrifying image because bees are like super cute. Hmm. But oh, bees. But most, like most cute things, you make them gigantic and they turn into absolutely terrifying. I was just and, having a conversation about this. Yeah, about the ant in Honey I Shrunk the Kids. Exactly. Because I hate ants. But anyway, sorry, bumblebees. Giant yeah, bumblebees. Such a weird. It's such a weird, it such, weird thing to it's hate. It's a weird phobia. Okay, ants and sand. <sighs> so. What we do get to see, though, is we talked about this when, when we got to watch Murphy watch Harry do magic, which I really liked. And here we get to see Fix and Meryl and the werewolves get to see, we get to watch them see Harry kind of cut loose a little bit. He does a forzare, you know, to kind of make a wall of force to stop the bees. And then a couple get around and so he fuegos the shit out of their wings. <laughs> And like he told Billy, I probably would use fire. Mm -hmm. So he used fire here. The goblins cheer. 
And they're all sitting there, you know, slack jawed. He's like, no, go, go, go. Like, <laughs> Let's roll, people. Let's roll. I'll, sh- I'll show you more fire magic later. We got to hustle right now. <laughs> but they're all just as impressed as him as they are with Mav. Oh, yeah. That's a really great point. Because Fix, he says even fewer words when he sees Harry do magic. Fix says, wow. And just stands there slack jawed. I thought that I was like, really I, significant. I didn't make that connection. Sorry, I didn't make that connection at all. I really like that. I do too, because it tells you Harry's significance. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've been talking about that mm-hmm. for novels now, where the only person who doesn't know how terrifyingly powerful Harry is it's is Harry. Harry. Yes. Uh, but yeah, no, that's a great catch. I just, I make love the big, buck. <laughs> the big buck. But I just loved that because even Meryl is staring at him with wide eyes. She had a, a, a veil of neutrality when she, w- when she met the fairy queen. But when Harry uses his fuego, which we're used to by now. Yeah, for us, it's just like, oh, yeah, you okay. fuegos, of course. You fuego. But I just, I love that so much. So, yeah, that was my, my moment there. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a great catch. I love it. Um, we see our group of treacherous, traitory, traitor, traitors. Mm-hmm. Technically speaking, I think is the technical term for it. <laughs> uh, they come up, and you know Harry tries to talk them out of it. Good, good, go get them. Titania knows they're gonna. They're not gonna let you do it. It's like, well, I mean, no one want. No one was gonna let me do it. I was gonna do it, bozo. Yeah. <laughs> but they cannot stop me. Cork with me. The rest of you, kill Harry Dresden. Kill them all. Um. And so we get to fight some mounted. She warriors here, as well as uh, Cork, our gigantic centaur, which is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is where I mentioned it last week that Fix with his toolbox is like I, I, it doesn't work for me. I get it; he's a mechanic. He's a little guy with a big ranch hat. Whatever. Um, Meryl getting out her axe and machete makes sense because we're going into a war, and those are weapons of w- weapons. Um, Fix is all bloody and he gets out a big old monkey wrench. <laughs> it just doesn't, again, it doesn't really, kind of like the, the opening of your, it just doesn't feel like it fits, you know what I mean, to, to me. Um, well, what do I know? Well, I think and, he is, he's from in my head, how I picture him, how I think he's described, he's a little guy. Mm-hmm. And he has the weight of a monkey wrench versus the weight of a sword. He doesn't have to have the force behind it. It doesn't have to be accurate. It doesn't have to be pretty. It's just effective. Oh, sure. But then grab that out of the van. Yeah. And walk up the, the steps. The, the, because we haven't seen anything else pulled out of the um, toolbox. The toolbox. That's, yeah. that's the other issue. We haven't seen anything else pulled out of it. If he pulled other things out of it, like how Jerry, Jerry, Harry has his satchel or his uh, doctor's doctor's bag, which he's often pulled different things out of. Yeah. But Fix only pulls out the monkey wrench, which is confusing. Kicking nits for sure. But he should have just grabbed the monkey wrench at the beginning. I don't think this adds to his character. And you're right. It's like Chekhov forgot about the... uh, toolbox yeah it's just I, the toolbox is just it's and i don't i don't quite need it how about that's a good word yeah exactly it's just you know he could have just grabbed the monkey wrench for the beginning and then you're right i mean him having a big steel club to fight fairies makes a ton of sense yeah um it's just yeah i think that whole thing of just bring bringing the toolbox getting it out of the, it's just a, a weird progression um again it, it doesn't matter it's i just, mean Maybe at some point in the writing process, there was another intent for it where he had something else in it and something like that. I get. Yeah, like, no, when you mentioned that, that made me think that maybe that was the case too. Um, I only say this because I've read it seven times this week <laughs> between the novel and the audiobook. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the way these things jump out at me and I, I overdo it. But um, yeah, no, I like that thought. Maybe there used to be more to it. Mm-hmm. But um, either way, he, he's got a big steel club that makes tons of sense, Josh. Yeah. And um, the werewolves are, are howling, and we're ready to, to get after this. He even Fix gives out a battle cry, which I like, a little shriek. And the best line in these four chapters, or five chapters for me at least, is 
Harry gives his own battle cry. <laughs> I don't believe in fairies. I love it. And so this next chapter is their par- they're continuing the charge. Cavalry charges are all about momentum. You get a ton of furious horse and warrior going in one direction and flatten everything in your way. As the she cavalry came thundering toward us along the banks of the river, and as my heart pounded in my chest and my legs started shaking in fear, I knew that if I wanted to survive the next few seconds, I had to find a way to steal that momentum and use it for myself. And Harry at this point realizes that the she riders with their their warding gestures and bursts of power, the protective charms only are affecting the warrior, not the horses. So he decides, well, all right. So he raises a shield, but not a wall in front of me. Such a warding would have brought the fairy nobles into contact with it. And no one wizard could hold a spell against the wills of a score of fairy lords. I brought up the shield, only a couple of feet high, and stretched it in a ribbon across the ground at the feet of Slate's Mount. So the horses hit the wall, and they all go down. And we talk a lot about Harry kind of being a bozo sometimes. Uh But he really, I mean, it's mostly just... He's observant as all hell. With women, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's like, we do talk, I, I, I at least certainly say, use that word a lot. You know, like, bozos, like, feels like a soft, like, this is, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, this is really clever. Oh, very. He can't use magic on the she, but he maybe I win. can on the horses. I, I feel like it's really a clever angle. I like that. Yeah, I love, I really, really do like that. Um, but it also shows Harry's skill with observation. And we see that time and again where Harry leads us to believe that, oh, he's not very good. Oh, he's kind of shitty at this. But then he does shit like this, which is above and beyond observant and intelligent. And I love it. And so Talos is going after Harry and Meryl steps between them. She is fighting the summer lo- the summer's Lord Marshal. And he is strong. And he asks, why do you do this, changeling child? You who have struggled against winter so long, it is useless. Stand aside. I wish no harm to thee. Like you wish no harm to Lily, Meryl shouted. How can you do that to her? It does not please me, child. But it is not for me to decide. She is my queen. She's not mine, Meryl snarled, and drove her forehead forward into Talus's nose. And then... Love a good headbutt. A real good headbutt. You know she's gotta be... Gotta... Oh, I just... I, it's just such a good move. I love it, in general. Just her rock-solid head. But it's just like this, that interaction where it's just... It shows us M- Meryl's... Kind of the depth of her. And she misses Slate coming up and stabbing her. And his sword goes into her side. I think they said something like a foot. And she just drops. Harry says, I felt the rage rising and climbed back to my feet, gripping my staff in both hands. Slate reached down and dragged Talos up from the ground and with one hand. Slate, I shouted, Slate, you murdering bastard. Harry gathers his rage and reached down into the ground beneath me found the fury of the storm within that matched my own. I thrust the end of my staff down into the misty cloud ground as if I'd been driving a hole through a frozen lake, then extended my my right hand towards the winter night. Ventas, I shouted. Ventas fulimo. The fury of the storm beneath us reared up through the wood of my staff, electricity rising in a buzzing roar of light and energy coming up from the ground and spiraling around my staff and across my body. It whirled down my extended right arm, a serpent of blue-white lightning, hesitated for a second, and then lashed across the space between me and the tip of Lloyd Slate's sword, fastening onto the blade and bathing Slate in a writhing coruscation of azure sparks. So he got nailed. Pretty good. 
and the thunder tears apart the air, and the shock wave of thunder knocked me down, together with everyone else in the immediate area, except for Talos. Again, the silence comes. Talos brings the silence, and he lifts his sword and comes right for Harry. And he says, and so it's, so it ends. You're damn right, I muttered. Look down. He did. I'd drawn my three fifty seven in my right hand while he'd knocked the staff out of my left. I braced my right elbow against the ground and pulled the trigger. The, a second roar of thunder, sharper than the first, blossomed out from the end of the gun. I don't think the bullet penetrated the dark fairy male because it didn't tear through Talos like it should have. It hit him like a sledgehammer instead, driving him back and toppling him to the ground. He lay there for a moment, stunned. It was cheap, but I was in a freaking war, and I was more than a little angry. And the iron, his face is burning and blistering where the steel of the, eye, of the gun, when he basically pistol whips him. I just think that it's, the bullet doesn't hurt him, but the iron in the gun does. I just thought that's fantastic. And then Lloyd swings a sh- shield, sorry, swings a ha- broken spear at Harry. He falls back down, and Slate has the gun. And he shoots at Harry. As shitty as Slate is, you gotta give him credit for keep just his, uh tenaciousness yes he's got a busted arm he does keep coming i mean it's he realizes a, just but a scratch fucked. he's i mean he's so fucked if they lose oh, but yeah. still i mean still it's impressive to keep coming yep but slate missed and a ferocious high-pitched shriek of fury made him whip his head to one side as a new attacker entered the fray fix brought his monkey wrench down in a two-handed swing that ended at lloyd Swate's. Lloyd Slate's wrist and Fix proceeds to beat the fuck out of Lloyd Slate. You hurt her, he Fix screamed. His next swing hit Slate in the side of his left kneecap and dropped the winter night to the ground. You hurt Merrill. And he just keeps beating him until he goes limp. And Fix comes over, came over to me and helped me up as he did. Wolves surrounded us, all of them bloodied, all of them with teeth, bl- teeth bared. And Fix tries to help Meryl. And Meryl, in her great wisdom, let me go. It isn't all that bad. See to the wizard. If he goes down, none of us are going home. And then she lies to Fix, saying that most of the blood isn't hers. Because she doesn't want it. She's still protecting him. And I think that's... I really like that. Yeah, I, I just love Meryl throughout this entire yeah. sequence. It's just so good. It, it, he developed her character so well. And in such a short time, too. Mm-hmm. It was like really impressive. It was, it was just... so fun. And she had worth. She had things she, that she feared. She had purpose. It was the whole gamut. It was just fantastic. But that, again, we keep talking about his characters, his, how, he well, how well he writes characters, how well he develops them. And this is a perfect example. And Billy says, we're going to have to run for it, Harry. There's more fight coming to us. We can't run, Meryl said. Aurora has Lily. Talk later, here they come. And then Billy turns back into a wolf. And the waters of the river begin to to boil. And cavalry. All dark blue, sea green, deep purples rose up from under the waves. This is just such a visual right now. Like, as I'm listening to the, when I was listening to the book, I could just see this. All those dark colors. The riders were more she-warriors, clad in warped-looking armor, decorated in stylized snowflakes. There were only a dozen of, of them to the summer warrior score, but they were mounted and attacking from behind. They cut into the ranks of the summer warriors, blades flickering, led by a warrior in mail of purest white, bearing a pale and cold-looking blade. The summer warriors turned to fight, but they'd been taken off guard, and they knew it. This is just amazing. And then they talk about freezing a warrior, and the pale rider took the pale rider almost negligently nudged her horse into a solid kick. The ice shattered into pieces and fell to the ground 
in a jumbled pile. And we learn that the pale rider is Maeve, the winter lady. She almost idly licked blood from her sword as another summer warrior fell to one knee, his back against the water, sword raised desperately against the riders confronting him. The water surged again, and pale, lovely arms reached out, wrapping around his throat from behind. I caught a glimpse of golden eyes and a green-toothed smile, and then the warrior's scream was cut off as he was dragged under the surface. Is that a... Selkie? What is that supposed A mermaid? I was trying to figure out what it was. Do you know? Oh, I don't know. Okay. A grindolo! I'm just curious. Your godmother sends her greetings, Maeve called to me. I'd have acted sooner, but it would have been a fair fight, and I avoid them. <laughs> Again, another character moment just in a line that was so spectacular. And so Maeve, Ma uh, Maeve's warriors are attacking further down the river so that Harry and his band of merry wolves and changelings can go towards upstream. And she leans down and purrs, Hello, Lloyd. We should have a talk. <laughs> and you know, so he is fucked. <laughs> Fixed hefted his bloodied monkey wrench. I recovered my staff, but my blasting rod was nowhere to be seen. The black doctor bag lay nearby, and I recovered it, taking time to check its contents before closing again. All right, people, let's go. And they head... Upstream. A cloud of pixies goes through them and gets caught in the webs of spiders the size of footballs. We have fairy hounds running past on the heels of a panther. Arrows are whistling by and everywhere lay the fairy dead and dying. He's going through a war zone to get to the table. Lily, Meryl called, through her, though her voice had gone thready. Fix whirled to look at her, his eyes alarmed, and Meryl dropped to one knee, her ugly, honest face twisting in pain. Get her, Fix. Save her and get her home. She looked around, focusing on me. You'll help him? You paid for it, I said. Stay here. Stay down. You've done enough. She shook her head and said one more thing. But she settled down on the ground, hand pressed to her wounded side panting and aurora and her band of traitors is at the table and she's trying desperately to stop everything she's holding mother winter's unraveling and harry uses the fantastic fetus wind basically and blows it out of her hand i caught it stuck my tongue out of aurora yelled meep meep and ran like hell. Was it this book or was it the previous book where they talk about his Looney Tunes moments? Well, that was this one when they were okay, at the was, Walmart. Okay, that's what I thought. And so I was just like, back to the Looney Tunes. And damn the wizard. And she goes after him, uses a similar wind tr trick, and gets the un uh, unraveling back. No more interruptions, Aurora spat. And a, a ferocious hedge with... Uh, Thorns, as long as Harry's hand grows up around her. And there's, hmm? right. there's some weird, very American. There's a, it's a thing that like Americans will use anything to avoid the metric system. Yes. Like, Hail the size of a, wa a washing machine or something. Yeah, I've seen that. And I love that. Yeah, you know, like, like uh, elephants that weigh as much as seven. Pool tables. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, ha hail the size of corn pops. Um, it's just like a meme on, yeah, at least on the it. internet. Yeah. I don't know if it really is over there. Um, but I do think it's funny. Yeah. But uh, he describes the length of a thorn based on his hand. Well, that's what he's got handy. Spiders based on footballs, mm -hmm. which are different shapes than spiders. And bumblebees the size of park benches. That is Those are really some funny. Weird fucking. <laughs> That's spectacular. I didn't even think about that. I didn't even notice it. There's just some strange ideas here. You do you, wizard. I'm on your side no matter what, but I just do think it's funny. That is really entertaining. I love it. 
I also wanted to touch on, you mentioned that the cavalry came and out of the uh, river. Mm-hmm. And for once it was for him, for him. Mm-hmm. Cause remember five or so chapters ago, he said, my life has been marked with a notable lack of cavalry. Yes, <laughs> But I like that. He used that word. It's yeah, very it much a good throwback. I love it. But that's the thing. There's all of these moments that they work so well. Um, so then, these callbacks are really like brilliantly crafted. Way more prevalent. And certainly, you know, as the books get, he gets better at his craft. But mm-hmm. like these callbacks are very, very good, very skillfully woven in, and I really do love it. They're they are very good, and he. He does a great job at his storytelling. Uh, the, the word I used a lot uh-huh. at on the conclusion of, of Stormfront, um, I believe it was inelegant. I think mm-hmm. was the one I was like, it just he, he had a good idea. He just didn't do it very elegantly. He's gotten very fucking elegant yes. at this point. Yes, he, he truly has. Really mastering his craft, and I again, I'm just a bozo who slams his head against the keyboard once a week. But I, I am so impressed. By these little these little moments mm-hmm. that you know connect throughout the stories, it's great. They really and he he does it very well. Uh, so Harry is da- Harry is outside the thorns. He needs to figure out how to get in, and a rider comes. Hooves gall- galloped up, striking the ground near me, and I looked up to see the warrior in green armor, the only rider of those original she cavalry to stay mounted. Standing over me, horse stamping, spear leveled at my head. Don't, I said, wait! But the rider ignored me, lifted the spear, its tip gleaming in silver light, and drove it down at my unprotected throat. Harumphing over here, just mm-hmm. so we're clear. <laughs> you, can't, you can't see it, but I'm harumphing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Harumph! Mm-hmm. Amen. <sighs> I know, yike. I'm not going to read through this because it's Elaine. <laughs> we don't like Elaine. Fuck that. Uh, fuck that bitch. Do not yike. I know she yike. Is no, not nice. Um, it, oh, it's Elaine. You know, we obviously, she's the only one really that we haven't seen yet. So it's kind of had to be her in the green armor. But, um, jerk face. Mm-hmm. She, uh, Harry says, I'd say I was glad to see you, but I'm not sure. Because, you finally are figuring it out for right. once in your life. You're dealing with a woman correctly, but um, making she good tries, choices. She tries to get him to leave, and and she gives us a kind of an expo dump on the thorns. It's a spell that she's seen before. They're poisonous. They're going to paralyze you. Um, two or three, just two or three pricks will, will will kill him, and they also won't burn. So he says he's going to force them aside, kind of just like lift up the gate and go through Mm -hmm. the problem is if he's focusing all his will and his power to hold it open once aurora recognizes that he's there he won't be able to also defend himself and fight back against her with her Mm -hmm. so he tries to get elaine to hold him off she begrudgingly agrees to it while also saying you know what if i betray you again bitch ass I don't know why you would say something like that because seriously, you're already up thin ice here, lady. Like, don't talk about the betrayals. Alyssa and Um, Joshi already don't like you. (laughs) I mean, obviously, that's the important part, right? (sighs) (laughs) He says he can trust her, and you know, he wants he wants to hurt. He wants to be able to trust her with his life as she can trust him with hers. Again, they have a lot of history, and. yeah, you know, I can't say I would be all that different, quite frankly, with my interactions with my exes. <laughs> I've made plenty of bad decisions. Um, it, you know, it, it's hard. Love dies hard. So I do understand where he's coming from on this one. It's just, she sucks. <laughs> yeah, like hardcore. She just, we don't, we know, we do not like her. Absolutely not. But in this case, he does, in fact, she, rather, she does, in fact, Come mm-hmm. through. Bonus points, I guess. Still in the negative, but, you know, she's crawling her way up out of that hole. <laughs> and um, Harry gets through the thorns. And right as Aurora is, has human, humanified, that's a word now, humanified. Okay. When she has humanified Lily and she has a knife, 
Harry comes up and just blasts her in the back with his staff, which I love. <laughs> Wasn't all that gentlemanly, but I slugged I the that. summer lady in the back. That. Especially, again, showing growth for him because this is, that's not something that the Harry of Stormfront would even consider. Not at all. And, and I'm not obviously sitting here saying that violence against women is a good thing, but this is violence against a bad guy trying to destroy the world. That's you gotta hit her, hit her right now so we can stop it. And she she sends a gout of fire at Harry, which is just a fun turnabout. Mm-hmm. How the how the turn tables and uh, dork. Right as he dodges one gout of fire, Talos does a really cool cinematic Tom Cruise action sequence leap <laughs> over the the thorns. Mm-hmm. <laughs> his horse didn't make it, so he kills his horse to do a cool flip. Uh, you would think there'd be a better way, but mm. he's in a hurry also. So, you know, we'll, we'll sacrifice. It's war. War is hell. <sighs> Before he has an opportunity to even defend himself or try to defend himself against the Lord Marshal, Meryl or something gigantic and scary tears open the thorns, these poisonous paralytic spell, uh, thorn, spell thorns, and she just rips them apart. Mm-hmm. There's a gigantic troll with green hair. Did you say pond scum color? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what he called it before, yeah. And I like, he says that it looks like a plastic picnic knife now, the giant machete she was holding. And she is all pricked up by the thorn. She is going to die. She's bleeding mm-hmm. all over. But this is Meryl the troll. She and she's only choice. got eyes for Talos. And not and in the romantic way. Not in the romantic way. Who knows how trolls get it on, but she (laughs) certainly, not in a way that Talos wants. How's that? Um, She uh, fucks him up, which is great and I love, but this distraction almost allows Aurora to do the snip snip on Lily's neck. Mm -hmm. And I love this. Again, I mean, I I went a couple weeks not referencing Harry Potter, (laughs) but this is such a great, parallel to me with the last scene you know the 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 final uh confrontation where you know what i know something you you don't know tom riddle and uh harry says the same thing because i know something you don't and he opens up his bag and instead of it being something serious and powerful and like life-changing she says what could you possibly know and he says the phone number to pizza express Get her too. <laughs> I was walking through the Walmart parking lot when I was I had my headphones in and this came on. I was like, "Oh, oh did you just cheer?" I really <laughs> Let's go! Yeah, probably a little embarrassing. In but that's the name okay. of the Pizza Lord, let's fucking go. Three words, four syllables. Let's freaking go. So <laughs> spectacular. Za Lord's guard chops her up with their box knives from Walmart and beyond but it being a lot of blades, steel blades. Yeah, beyond it being a lot of blades, they are also cold iron alloyed into steel. But it is cold iron and that alone would have been enough. But they also slice and dice and there's a lot of them and they're, they're fast and everyone underestimates them, the guard, except for one Harry Dresden. And I'm glad he doesn't because Toot Toot is a badass and I love... I love that he gets the finishing moment here. He wins the war. He mm-hmm. shuts it down. He su- saves the day. Because yep. Toot Toot, Major General Toot Toot Minimus Major. is a badass. I love Toot Toot. I was literally, I audibly yayed. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a, you know, kind of conversation as she's dying. She, she, she just wanted it to stop hurting. And he, he says that... Uh, the only people who never hurt are dead. I don't understand. I don't either. A tear slid from her eye and mixed with blood. Then she died. Mm-hmm. Pretty sad. But it was necessary. And he says, I'd done it. I'd saved the girls, stopped the thief, proved Mab's innocence, and won her support for the White Council, thereby saving my own ass. Huzzah. 
I do like the huzzah, the huzzah with a period after with it. a period it's that's so what it's, incongruous. It's, yeah, I love it. That's why you said it that way, yeah. and I love that you said it that way. <laughs> and it's it's just again those little things are like the capitalizations, the punctuations, the way things are written on the page are just as good as the way the characters are developed. It's fantastic. We learn that Toot Toot's not going to be getting into any trouble. It is unusual for a mortal to be able to call any of the fairy, even the lowest, into service. But it has been done before. Fear not for your little warriors. They were your weapon, and the only one accountable for their actions will be you. Take their steel with you, and it will be enough. You're going to live up to your side of the bargain. Of course, the wizards will have safe passport. Not that bargain. Ours. First, let me make you an offer. We have a traitor among us, and he will be dealt with accordingly, after which there will be an opening for a new knight. I would have someone worthy of more trust as his successor. Accept that power, and all debts between us are cancelled. Not just no. Hell no. Very well, then. I'm sure we can find some way to amuse ourselves with this one until time enough has passed to offer again. And Slate is still alive. So, uh, that's gonna be fun. As he walks away, uh, he hears Lloyd Slate's screams lingering. And Ebenezer picks him up off the ground and he wakes up back in his home in his bed. What happened, I asked when I could speak. Meryl died. She told me to tell you that she'd made her choice and didn't regret it. Then she just changed. We found her on the green ground near you. And choice there is capital C, because it was, it was a big deal. It was her choice. She made her choice. And she... She knew she, I think she knew she was going to die and she did this to save everybody. And, and she did between her and Toot. Those are our two heroes here. Yeah, no, she definitely. She sacrificed herself. Was dying. She was dying probably, but yeah, there, it definitely is a sacrifice and, and in more ways than one, right? Mm -hmm. She, by tearing through the poison thorns, she sacrificed of herself mm -hmm. to be, become the troll time. Like she had to give mm -hmm. up any semblance of who she was and in a, a universe where yeah. everything exists, there's also like afterlife. And well, and the thing too is, uh, okay, sorry, you cut out. So I thought you were being quiet. Oh no, no, <laughs> I, I, I was not. I mean, I just, I, I don't know what, you know, be, I don't, we don't know enough about what happens when creatures of fairy die or, or if they can die. Right. Mm. Um, so did she die on the stone table, though? No. No, yeah. Because so, she was laying next to Harry. Yeah, so I don't know if she can die. Now, that's well, interesting. But why couldn't she? Because she's a creature of fairy. They're, but, all, but they're the, all but immortal. All but immortal. They can be killed. They don't die naturally, I think is what it is. At least that's how I understood it. Yeah, interesting. That that's something that I'm here. I mean, I'm, I'll tell you right now, we haven't seen her over the last the, the future 15, 14 novels or whatever from yeah. here. That's spoilery. I'm sorry, um, but I I do wonder. I do wonder because they're all but immortal. I mean, certainly in this moment, yeah. you're treating it as, and we're supposed to take it as a sacrifice, and that's supposed to be her the end of her story. And I, I love, I love everything about that. I'm more thinking outside the box and more like yeah. down the road. Like, is there a universe where she could come back as a, bring as a back troll? Meryl? Are we starting a hashtag bring back Meryl? I think bring back, <laughs> but it's Meryl the troll. So she's not the same. Person she's not she Meryl. Is. Well, but that was also, I mean, yeah, that also was a sacrifice. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's, that was the bigger, so I not think the just bigger for her sacrifice. Life. Yeah. I think that was the bigger sacrifice than her life. Cause she gave up herself, her being which is way more important, I guess. Oh, man, it goes back to the question that the mothers, the, uh, mothers asked Harry. What's more important, your soul or your body? Uh-huh. That's, 
Oh, she gave both. She gave up both. My goodness gracious. That's a con- I've never made that connection before. Either. That's interesting. Interesting. Hmm. I'm sure most of our readers, <laughs> listeners have, but certainly one or two of them probably <laughs> didn't. And that's really interesting. I like that a lot. Cause I she- do too. I le- but again, it's those, those sowing the seeds. Mm-hmm. God, this is I, at the beginning. I said I didn't like it, and I I didn't like the very beginning, and I don't really love this last chapter. And I'll tell you why after, or as mm-hmm. we get through it. But I loved this. I love this. Not once we got really to the White Council meeting, mm-hmm. and it kind of like got more focused. I loved every second of this novel, and I, I'm glad. Yeah, no, I'm I'm. This was a, a really fun experience for me to go through it and see all these little Easter eggs and stuff, callbacks and You're welcome. <laughs> I appreciate it. Like I said, this is just a book club with my sister, and anyone who wants to listen along is welcome, and I'm really excited that people do. But the whole point of this charade was to get my sister to read these books and uh, analyze them with me. <laughs> yep, and here we are. Oh, goodness. This is, it, this is, I really did enjoy this. Um, mm-hmm. And that? so... So Harry's back at his house and Billy says, you know, the alphas are, are all good. They're all alive. They're banged up 155 stitches altogether. But we all came out of it a lot. We all came out of it more or less in one piece. Pizza party and gaming at my place tonight. So Harry takes a shower, gets dressed in clean clothes, and then realizes, he asks Billy, you cleaned up? Did laundry? Not me. And then somebody came to the door and it was the new summer lady and night. They looking for trouble. Just come talk to them. The room is spotless though. He, as he's walking to the door, he's seeing his apartment is spotless. Everything looks clean furniture. There were no stains. The rugs were clean underneath. The rugs were clean. The, there was fresh wood. The floor was mopped and scoured. The flower, the fireplace had been emptied and like, his staff and blasting rod are back as well, which I think is, that was kind of cool. Guns polished. So all of the things he lost up in the clouds are back. Ice boxes filled. Everything is, his pantry is restocked. And he looks at Billy and, and oh, sorry, Billy's kind of like, come on, visiting dignitaries. Uh, I went to the door and opened it warily, peeking around it. And there was Fix and Lily. Lily's the new summer lady, and Fix is her summer night. And he says, are, are you okay? I'm not, sh-. she says, she frowned, I'm not sure. It's a lot to think about, and it's the first time this kind of power has fallen to a mortal. You mean you're not, uh, you haven't chosen? Lily asked. No, it's just me. I don't know what I'm going to do, but Titania says she'll teach me. And you chose Fix as your knight, huh? I trust him. Suits me. Fix kicks. Fix kicked the winter knight's ass once already. Lily blinked and looked at Fix. The little guy flushed, and I swear to God, he dragged one foot over the ground. I wanted to meet you and to thank you, Mr. Dresden. I owe you my life. You don't owe me anything. I'm apparently saving damsels on reflex now. Besides, I was just hired. Thank Marrow. What do you mean now? Right? That's what I was like, bro. Bro. But they come in and visit for a minute. Harry has fixed up his car and he learns that Lily had some brownies come clean up his place. So they come in and he says, we had a nice visit. They seemed like decent kids. And then Elaine shows up. Oh, harumph. Harumph. Right. But she does say... When she says, can I give you some advice? He says, why not? Stop feeling sorry for yourself, Harry. You were living in a sewer, Harry. I understand there's something you're blaming yourself for. I'm just guessing at the details, but it's pretty clear you were driving yourself into the ground because of it. Get over it. You aren't going to do her any good living as a mildew collection. Stop thinking about how bad you feel, because if she cares about you, it would tear her up to see like see her, you like I saw you a few days ago. I mean, that's good advice. Oh, it's great advice, but She's I still an hate, asshole. hate, 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 
mm-hmm. hate, hate, hate yep. that she thinks she's entitled yeah. to this conversation. I, I think Her bringing up Susan and the engagement ring, like she has no business being here. Like the fact that she's here is like be, you know because they're old friends and like. Mm-hmm. But she that, doesn't get that right. Uh, I mean, to be fair, she's also had the same socialization issues as Harry, right? So I, well, I, I think not... we give him more grace than her at this point because we've been with him in his brain for a few novels. But she also like just was a horrible person and was like, not just, this has nothing to do with socialization. Yeah. It was yesterday. <laughs> mm-hmm. This wasn't like, you know, years ago and we've got to gotten, you know, come to a place where we can forgive it. This was yesterday. And you're going to sit here and talk about Susan and the engagement ring. Like I, I just, Fuck you bitch. Yeah. I mean, it is really good advice just so we're clear. And like, yeah, no, it totally is. Totally is. But I, I just, I, I get it. Her, my dislike of her is coloring this. Oh, hundred percent. But yeah, no. But then he goes over to the Alpha to Billy's apartment and has pizza and Coke and plays a game with them. And Billy, sweet, sweet Billy. You know what disappoints me? Billy asked after a while. No, what? All of those fairies and duels and mad queens and so on. And no one quoted old Billy Shakespeare. Not even once. I stared at Billy and started to laugh. My own aches and bruises and cuts and wounds pained me. But it was an honest, stretchy pain. Something that was healing. I got myself some dice and some paper and some pencils and settled down with friends to pretend to be Thorg the Barbarian. To eat, drink, and be merry. Lord, what fools these mortals be. And I, I lo- fucking I love that. Ending. Love that. That's such a great. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. It really, really is. Do you have Thu's in your quotes of the week? Is that why you skipped him? No. Oh, I uh, learned a new word when it, I mean, this was a, a, most of a decade ago. Um, I, I, I do this every so often in this series in particular, but a lot of them where you just contextualize a word and you, you know what it means, but you don't uh-huh. know the definition. You know what I mean? Um, but where he says he wants big bulging thews. He doesn't want to think too much. Um, I've never heard that term for like Mm-mm. bulging muscles. Um, I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> I mean, it, it's very clear what it means by reading it, but I'd never heard oh, yeah, that. But I, I never heard Well, I wasn't sure if it was a reference to like the barbarian or if it was a reference to his form or what. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I just assumed it was big muscle. I looked it up and it was big. Oh, muscle. Okay. Muscular. I looked it up for this podcast. I d- didn't for, you know, I, like I said, I've read this forever. Um, right. I just like lear- learning is great. Yeah. And uh, there's actually a, a Dresden tabletop rpg where some actually some of the lore comes from but oh, um, cool and i think it's maybe it, i think it's canon or maybe just they ask uh jim and he says what's canon and what's not but um i never played i uh tabletop can't imagine anyone wants to be in a room locked in a room with just my brain for that that amount of time but <laughs> put it on the list i enjoy it i used to um pre-pandemic we would go to a theater where my friend is a um production manager and we would play games on stage on stage after the yeah we talked about uh, me trying to sneak in yeah um come out and just uh then the whole uh everyone was dying of a terrible disease yeah that was problematic oh that was lame wasn't it (laughs) let's not die of terrible diseases huh i mean that would be good i vote for no more pandemics but that's just i same (laughs) um so i did mention this is way too neat for me. Okay. And you know how I said he, he saw, he answers questions. This is just a yes. Like, yep. Yep. Da, 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 da. Where it's like, Billy comes over. The ne- summer lady comes over. Elaine comes over. He, yeah. he goes to see the alpha. You know, it's just like, so like perfectly wrapped up with a bow. Um, I didn't love that. I don't hate it. It's not the end of the world. Well, it's there's I, there's a trope for just people coming to the door where it's 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 very much a they do it in plays, or that's how your story moves along. Someone comes over. Okay. Yeah. Like, I mean, and tropes exist of, because they work. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like there's yeah. a reason tropes exist. 
Yeah, no, definitely. So, yeah, and I didn't hate it. I just did want to call it out because we've been fawning over his abilities. And that was just, he. I feel like he, he usually does a better job wrapping it up while making it interesting. Yeah. And teasing the future. So I do love the Lord of Fools these mortals be. That actually oh, that, pops- is, that is great. That, 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 yeah, no, that's absolutely yeah. perfect. Well, I love pop- actually the whole, sorry. That's from um, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah, no, I know. With Titania is a character in it, which is fantastic. And it's Puck who says it. It's about fairies, which is just, that's, I thought that was just so wonderful. I was just like, oh, this is fantastic. It, is Mab not in that one? Uh, no, Mab is not in it. It is just the fairies. Mab is mentioned in Romeo and Juliet. And there's another one she's mentioned in, but I do not recall which other one she's mentioned in. But yeah. I, uh, am a Shakespeare nerd. I mean, I have a theater degree, so that kind of goes <laughs> hand in hand. You kind of have to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I did like that. Um, no, I love that whole scene at Billy's is great. I love mm-hmm. that. Um, it just, like I said, just sees it the way it's like that, 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 and like wraps up so perfectly. But um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love, you, you know me, I love it, all his interactions with, uh, with Billy are just great. Yeah, I really, well, and the other thing I, I actually, um, when I was listening to it for like the third or fourth time today, um, he talks about how ni- what nice kids uh, Lily and Fix are. He is the big brother. He's got the alphas under his wing. He's got Lily and Fix under his wing. He is trying to be what he didn't have when he was young. That's the way oh, I see it. No, I love that for sure. And it really, and I, it really just, I love that so much. And I love the, that line where he says, you know, Billy and the rest, I, I want to say that you handed yourselves up there a lot better than I expected or hoped, which is kind of a backhanded compliment, but yeah. it's a compliment, but I should have given you more credit. Thank you. Like he's acknowledging. Oh yeah. He, he hasn't trusted them enough. Like I, that's a really hard thing for Harry to do. Definitely. Both apologize and, and trust. But like I, that is more than just that sentence right there. Like that is him, you know, tr- giving the, a level of trust to the alphas. Like they, they aren't just kids kid vigilantes on the street like they're they're heavy hitters that like he ch- can trust with his life like i thought that was a really definitely cool, and, but he also he gives credit where credit is due with fix as well mm-hmm. and so he he is these are kids he refers to them as kids they're the young people but he still gives them credit where credit is due he doesn't take credit for the things they do i really i just i really like What's developing here with that? Yeah, no, his like mentor angle is great mm-hmm. for sure. Definitely. And it's just, I really just like it a lot. I truly do. There's so much that it's just, it's good shit. So, I mean, we have kind of done a lot of the, the talking as we go through it, mm-hmm. but um, again, I just want to reiterate that I said a couple times at the beginning, this, this isn't my favorite, and it is definitely <laughs> of the ones we've read so far, this is certainly my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really liked it, so. Um. Yeah, I, I really did enjoy this book. I loved the nitty gritty aspects of it, the storytelling aspects of it. And it really, it, it, I really, it's the, the, the character development is fantastic. The storytelling is fantastic. All of those cinematic, cinematic moments are fantastic. I really just enjoyed it. Yeah. And I mentioned this early, early on that like, he it was he was so early in his career with Stormfront that he was bound to improve. I knew he did because I love the series and like you know some of the later novels are like some of my favorite novels of the the world. Um, but I didn't realize how quickly he like really became great. You know the first couple are, are good and there's some really cool stuff like his pacing, and action scenes we talked a lot about were really good. Um, most of the way he weaves in. Um, Exposition was pretty good, pretty good, mm-hmm. but this is like 
I don't want to say masterpiece because it's certainly there are, there are issues, but like it's, it's well a really crafted. well crafted. Yeah, it is a really well crafted novel. It's the same thing with Marsters is improving as he goes, yes. really hitting his stride. Um, I was hoping our podcast would improve at the same rate, but we'll have to catch <laughs> up. Um, but it really is impressive how quickly he's gone from, oh, this is a cool idea and I really like it. And he's certainly got, he's got this kid's got some talent, you know? Yeah. To Jesus, this is this dude's an amazing writer. Um, mm-hmm. Just I really love it. And um, like you said, just really well crafted. I like that. Mm-hmm. Your, your word choices, your diction is far better than mine. <laughs> awesome. Um, do you have any uh, questions or, you know, uh, my big question was, is she actually dead? I know they said she was and they think she is, but I'm actually curious about the laws of the universe. All but immortal doesn't sound like you can get poked by a thorn and die. I wouldn't call that all but immortal. You know what I mean? Like that sounds yeah. pretty fragile. So but I, she had I, also had a, a, a sword lodged in her side. You know, it was a combination of things. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, for sure. I, I'm, I'm just thinking that description for me doesn't sound like she, you know, something would have died from yeah. that. So maybe, you know, obviously she did in the story, Like as far as like this text, she's dead. I just yeah. wonder outside and moving forward. That's a good do, question. Though. That is a really be. good question. Yeah, I mean, Could she yeah. turn up later? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be really cool. A, it'd be a really cool surprise. Yeah. Uh, B, it'd be really interesting to see how sentient she was as a troll. Mm-hmm. Because she Very clearly... True. Well, she still executed her goal, right? Yeah. She saved Lily. She, you know, just, you know, she fought off the bad guys. She got through the thorns. So, like, she had some... I don't think that th- th- uh, trolls are, like, just mindless beasts. I know, we, I know Grum wasn't actually a... Um, ogre but harry did mention that they have some semblance you know yeah but i I wonder how sentient she would be and i mean there's there's got to be some fanfic out there um we'll (laughs) dig into um meryl and uh yeah i mean (laughs) it's there's just i really do i love the characters i do i truly truly do yeah and that she was really, really done well in that last uh, third act. Yeah, for sure. I, her development, Mara was just fantastic development. Truly, truly. Mm-hmm. Do you have any questions or concerns, comments? No, my only question was what that thing that grabbed that summer night into the, or summer warrior into the river was. Everything else is pretty much, pretty well Defined, we did not get a mister in the end there. What happened to mister while the brownies were cleaning the apartment? Oh, my yeah. God. Where'd mister go? That just hit me. Sorry. It just hit me like a ton of breaks. Like, oh, my God. We have to check on the cat. Yes. Magic. So I'm trying to find that uh, deal with the creature. Mm-hmm. Where was it? It was in the second to last chapter. My chapter or yours? Mine, I think. Let That's me what see. I thought. My second to last chapter, sorry. That's the one I'm looking through. So. The, uh, it's page 360. Oh. The water surged again and pale and lovely arms reached out, wrapping from behind his throat. I caught a glimpse of golden eyes and a green toothed smile. And then the warrior scream was cut off as he was oh. dragged under the surface. Yeah, I think that's that's probably Jenny Green Teeth. Oh, 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 I didn't catch that either. Nice. OK, OK, Jenny Green Teeth. I love it. Right. That's got to be. That's yeah, awesome. I think it, it has to be. That makes coming a lot out of, of water sense. the kind of the same way. This is certainly a lot less sexy. Yeah. Depending on your, I like it. I like it. That's we awesome. don't kink shame at the podcast was on fire. <laughs> no, we do. Be not. safe and communicate. <laughs> That's awesome, though. I like that. Yeah. No. I, again, just another kind of connection callback. That uh, yeah. I really, I like it. I love it. It's it's very interesting. Very cool. Uh, and I, the uh, the the soul body thing with Meryl I I I really like um mm-hmm. just yeah I mean it is a Harry's like it's a stupid question 
It was yes. she needed. It was stupid for her. She needed to get rid of both uh, to save her friends, and uh, yeah, it's just and she did. Really cool um, character did that. Uh, like I said, yeah. I I hope there's some fan fiction or that uh, we maybe we see her again coming moving forward. That'd be awesome. Deep, deep, deep into the series, but um, yeah. Short of that, um, do we have anything in the yikes nice. front? No. I didn't, I don't think so. I can't think of any. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward description of Elaine when she comes Mm -hmm. over. I mean, Lily's a shapely figure. That's, I mean, that's whatever. Nothing creepy or weird. And that's really like when his real problem was cute young girls like that would have been uh Mm -hmm. uh, we may not have a yikes section by the end wow that's kind of cool though there definitely are some that i i you know i can tell you some moving forward Mm -hmm. but um again it just shows the maturity and the the growth as an author um it doesn't change our perception of harry we still get that he's this chivalrous kind of uh I don't want to say misogynist, but um, what's the term that he uses? I don't know. Where he doesn't, he has to protect women and stuff. Uh, I, I have no idea. I don't remember. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. But he, it doesn't change. Like it, it isn't changing his characterization. It's just uh-huh. less gross. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Yeah, it so truly I, is. Yeah, so I again just really really impressed by how not just that he improved because obviously i knew that by reading some of the more recent novels but like mm-hmm. quickly it went from like really there was a lot of really problematic stuff early mm-hmm. on and great storytelling and some really good stuff also but a lot of really problematic stuff and that was this novel was very hard to find uh, stuff was, on the i think that we, he was too busy writing a war that's fair there was a lot going on but um but yeah no credit where credit's due for sure heck yeah um all right um what do you have for your quotes of the week oh i have a couple of them some of them we already read uh as per yush of course but let's see so this is we started with i i already said put the teeth put put the teeth and cutlery away uh we need to play nice little while longer i really liked that i don't believe in fairies but the uh the gun roared, and I waited for a light at the end of what I was pretty sure would be a downworld, a downward sloping tunnel. Oh, that was one of mine. I only have two this week, too. <laughs> <laughs> the downward sloping tunnel I thought was great. Well, and then I, when he was in his apartment, I died, I said. I died, and someone made a clerical error, and this is heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I like that his heaven, his heaven version of heaven is... It's just a clean apartment. His, still his apartment, but just slightly, yeah. slightly nicer. Yeah. It's pretty spectacular. Yeah. Who he is. He, he likes what he likes. Yeah. Um, is that what you got? Yeah. So you stole my downward sloping tunnel. But, um, <laughs> I, I, I do love, really, it's in the context, but also just the meet me. That yes. uh, I, I did terribly there, but. James Marsters does such a great Roadrunner meep. He on does the, on the audiobook. It is worth mentioning just for that. But also the fact that he steals the thing from this like absurdly powerful fairy queen uh-huh. and then does a Roadrunner noise and tries to sk- skedaddle <laughs> and so immediately gets smacked down. <laughs> oh yeah, but it's it it is pretty great. It is hilarious. Um, Yeah, downward sloping tunnels, by the way. Also, the I already mentioned it when you were reading it, but just the way that I mean, clearly, I really love the Harry Potter novels. I, mm-hmm. I really d- dislike the Harry Potter author, but Jim Dale doing the audiobooks is like uh-huh. so good. I think Stephen Fry maybe do yes, Stephen the, Fry did them, and they're yeah, the, the British version of it is great too. But Jim Dale is like the gold standard for me, at least for 
an audiobook narrator. Uh Um, But this conversation, because I know something you don't, it it is so hard for me to not hear him, you know, do the because I know something you don't, Tom Riddle. I know a lot of important things, (laughs) but that scene and just the complete opposite level of seriousness. Yeah, I just find so hilarious, and I I could it could just be me, but no, I I love it. I love how he's just not. He doesn't take anything serious. All of the quips in the times of danger. It's fantastic. He's face to face with a fairy queen about to basically end the human existence on this earth. And uh, he makes a little quip, but it's the juxt the uh, not juxtaposition, but the uh, kind of comparison to that Harry Potter line that really does it for me. But I know something you you don't. What could po- you possibly know? The number to Pizza Express. I love um, that. And something we didn't talk about real quick there about um, the generous is they're taking a huge risk themselves. Yeah. Not just as far as the physical risk, but they're bringing iron to a fairy event. Like, yeah, they, the Queens don't like that. And, you know, obviously Harry clarified that with Mab at the end, but to may or may not have been sure that that was going to be the case. Yeah. So it, it adds another layer of bravery and heroism. Um, very true. Very, very true. Do what Toot gets up to. Um, I, I just love Toot. I do too. <laughs> There's a, uh, one of the TikTokers you, you can't watch because they're all super spoilery. Um, <laughs> although the one that is uh, just ships, one gal ships uh, Harry and Marcone real hard. It's just, <laughs> text uses text. That like, uses the text. Yeah. It's really, really great. But um, there's a conversation on, on one that, another one about, um, I can find out the name because I really, um, that Toot will eventually wield Amarakis. Oh, I like that. Um, I mean, there's no. I know it won't. This no, I just possible. mean like there's, there, there isn't any like real textual evidence no. to that. Just besides, Toot's awesome. Toot, and we, we love Toot. Toot. <laughs> Your point. But uh, I just love that. I it was just funny whether it's I'm like, on it's board a with that guy with yes. a gigantic sword or. Like, <laughs> um, I fa- I fucking love that. I think that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, you know, decades and decades down the road, just a very funny idea. Um, but yeah. Um, do you have any, uh, oh, let me want to look at, um, I'm looking at the, I was looking at the chapter now. That's why I asked you earlier today what the name of the book was. Mm-hmm. How deep do we read into it? First page. I'm thinking it, I'm not reading it. I'm just looking at the cover. Oh no. But remember, I also think you should read the first, like the first page sentence or the first pa- couple okay. paragraphs. The first page I'll do. It, the. It won't really help you here. I don't think, but, uh, uh, cause this is, this is the thing. This is on Amazon, the Kindle. There's like. Uh, two paragraphs some things that aren't meant to go together oh, oh sorry some things just aren't meant to go together things like oil and water orange juice and toothpaste wizards and the television spotlights glared into my eyes the, the heat of them threatened to make me sweat streaks through the pancake makeup some hor- harried stagehand had slapped on me a few minutes before lights on top of camera started winking on the talk show theme song began to play and the studio audience audience began to shoot larry 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 like I said, okay. That's not going to help you. No. But take a moment. R.I.P. Jerry Springer, who was yeah. the inspiration, clearly in my mind at least, for Larry Fowler, who you're going to meet here uh, <laughs> in a Obviously. moment. Um, but looking at the cover, so the cover is the our silhouette of who we now know, who we've learned is Harry. He's walking down a hall of some sort or walking into a hall. Uh, in which there are multiple pillars on the back. Uh, what's it called? Back One of the pillars in the back or on the wall, there's crossed swords. There's a large arch. It's almost like something like a New York City, like in Ghostbusters. Um, the, the building they go into where the slime river happens. <laughs> so my guess, I'm thinking it's going to have something to do with the White Council. And somebody's going to be dead. I'm pretty smart, I'm, you know. <laughs> Fair yeah, enough. Uh, there really isn't a whole lot to go on with this one. There, are, some of the other ones, like I wish we had thought of this for uh, 
like full moon, you know, that's very uh-huh. clear. But um, I'm really just excited for you to read live for the first time a couple of the first sentences. So yeah. we're going to keep, we're, we are going to keep doing this, even if it doesn't uh, lead to anything else um, here. But do you have any uh, crackpot theories here as far as, you know, we, wh- where we're going on the ferry front, where we're going on anywhere else? Um, I think that the gatekeeper is going to come into play more. I think that he's going to, he knows more about Harry's powers than Harry knows because the listening thing and, um, yeah, that shared power for that sure. That shared power that they have. I, and he seems less than mortal. Um, but he is on the council. So that's kind of like a, who knows? Um, but because of the whole thing with how they responded to Harry's powers, I think that there he's, there's more than meets the eye. And I think that um, it's not super crackpotty, but I think that Harry's more powerful than uh, that he's along those lines, like the gatekeeper. And the gatekeeper sounds very old and. Yeah. The old desert fox. Exactly. And the yeah. fact that the fact that Mab knew him. That, that Mab had again, we, we saw this earlier when they called her. Um, Ella, they called Elaine Ella um, at the uh, summer jungle the hotel jungle, right? Like mm-hmm. having being close enough to have a nickname. From Mab is yeah. interesting. Very interesting for sure. I dig. I dig. Um, I also have a crackpot theory. Okay. It has nothing to do with the Dresden Files. <laughs> um, we are one day away on this end. When you listen, it'll already have happened. But one day away from the final episode of Ted Lasso. I'm not going to spoil her anything because I don't know what happens. But um, I think they're not going to win the title. There you go. There's my crackpot theory. I just wanted to get that out in the universe. Um, Ted will go home. Beard's going to stay. That's what, that's, there's my real crackpot. Um, and none of this means anything to people who don't watch it, but I just wanted to get that on record. Oh, there was a line in this last week, which I had to tell you, where uh, someone's like, oh, that's just like Les Mis. He said, just like Les Mis. I went to prison for stealing a loaf of meth. <laughs> <laughs> It's just such a great line. Um, that is pretty spectacular. But uh, beyond that, um, yeah, I'm, I've already know what happens in Death Mask, so I'm not going to give a crap on the theory. <laughs> but I am excited. Um, like I said, we meet uh, some new feature creatures. We meet some new allies. And um, we also meet a very special character that I am really excited for you in particular to meet. Oh, wow. With uh, shared some shared experiences. I'll tell you what. Well, I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, okay. Ooh, ooh. Ooh. The people know what I'm talking about. They know what butters my bread. <laughs> wink, wink. Short of that, I guess we close this whole thing out. Yeah. So long farewell on this book. I am in the door shut on summer night. I was impressed. Um, Again, I mean, it's going to be true for every any book you read where you really get deeper into it. You're going to see more mm-hmm. stuff. But uh, I'm, I'm really loving this process. And, um, yeah, th- thanks for agreeing to do this. And thank you guys for coming along. I'm really excited. Um, beyond that, I have uh, – this may be a tricky week to get this out on time. So you may be listening to this on a Tuesday. Um, I have National Championship Qualifiers. Woo-hoo. starting Wednesday and goes all the way through Sunday. So I am going to be slammed on that front. So I'll do my darndest to get this thing edited out, but um, no promises, unfortunately that it'll get out on time. I'm going to say something on the TikToks as well, but um, yeah, I, I appreciate you guys understanding that I have to do a real job that gets paid until we grow this to millions of people. And um, Spotify just gives us the uh, Joe Rogan, contract which will it'll be two of us so it won't be as quite as lucrative but um, <laughs> we'll get there one of these days no i i uh really appreciate you guys and i am excited to dig into death masks mm-hmm. we are gonna go one through six all righty i do think i think we meet my favorite or one of my top two two or three favorite characters coming up here so all right um, really exciting times and uh, beyond that, guys, hit us up on uh, uh, the best thing you can possibly do is give us a rating on Spotify or Apple Pod or Google Pod or wherever it is that you decide, wherever it is you do your pod podding. 
um, just give us a, a like or a follow or a rating or, you know, whatever it is. You do what you do, but uh, <laughs> any sort of engagement, it would be really cool. It helps push us out there. And when people search, they don't have to write the whole 17 word thing out. Maybe they can write two or three words and seven words. But just delighted that this thing's still kicking. That Lissy, yeah. hasn't, Lissy hasn't stabbed me in the eyeball yet <laughs> and for making her do this and that uh, we are chugging right along. So like I said, I got a busy weekend. So hopefully I can get this thing. You're listening to this on Sunday. I really do hope so. And beyond that, I'm just delighted with the universe. I have been Josh. And I am Alyssa. With the podcast was on fire. And it wasn't my fault. Oh, and um, totally unrelated. Uh, I learned the um, word for when you can't remember a word or a name. It's lethologica. Lethologica. We're lethological. Oh, good. Another, another one to forget. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Because that happens to me all the time. And I was like, hmm. But yeah. Hundred and ninety eight from Australia. Mind boggling. We're awesome. Wait, that's pretty rad. Chicago is still our number one city. I love that.